Dear friends, grace, hope, faith be to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It was a, a grand public works project, truly magnificent, that had taken not years but decades to build. It used fine craftsmanship and, and some of the world's most precious building materials. It must have cost a fortune, paid by exorbitant taxes, of course, but this was no bridge to nowhere, you know, funded by politicians who favor earmarks uh, in the budget to benefit their well-connected business cronies. Contemporary reports said that over 18,000 workers labored on this project. And when it was finally done, when it was done, the unemployment of those 18,000 skilled workers became a serious and worrisome issue for the government. I'm referring not to something that you may have missed uh, in, in today's news or, or on Twitter. This project, which went on for more than 50 years, was the building of the Great Temple and the compound in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Most people who, who read the Bible have little idea of its grandeur or its national and uh, political, religious, cultural importance for this temple. All that's left today, of course, is the enormous mountaintop terrace or, or, or plaza that supports the Muslim holy shrine, the Dome of the Rock. It's a plaza that is more uh, than the size of a football field. God's temple in Jerusalem, of course, was the national center. For very elaborate rituals and, and the rites and, and prayers, the sacrifices that were required of, of every Jew for important events or milestones in, in their lives, during the high holy days, such as Passover, thousands of pilgrims would come up to Jerusalem for these ceremonies. And like any big public event in our times, they brought with them a lot of cash, not only for food and lodging, but to pay for the sacrificial animals and to pay the priests for their rituals and to make offerings for the poor as well. By the time of Jesus, what had developed was an incredible system of religion that gave many a, a sense of pride, but it also gave many others a source of profit. As pilgrims came from far and wide, they brought with them the currency of the Roman Empire, which of course meant that the coins had the inscription and the, the face, the uh, uh, profile of the emperor on the coins. But to pay the priests and to buy the doves and exchange it, they had to exchange it for the temple coins, which by the law of Moses meant that those coins were forbidden to have a graven image on them, the likeness of any human being. If you've ever needed to exchange currency, you know, like in, in, in this or another country when you're traveling abroad, you know how important it is to get a fair exchange rate and to watch your dollars and your drachmas so that you don't get cheated, right? So there's evidence that people profited enormously, especially from the religious tourism of, of the day. Not just the vendors and the money changers of the temple grounds, but even the Roman government was profiting. They collected hefty tax revenues. Everyone had his hand in the religious cookie jar. In my, in my childhood Bible, and I'm sure many Bibles, that good Christians carry with them every week to church, uh -huh. there are, in those Bibles, there are little subtitles or, or little topical headings that are printed every so often to help you find your way around. And this passage is typically labeled in those old Bibles, the cleansing of the temple. Well, I'm not a clean freak, but I'm bright enough to figure out that by the time this scene with Jesus is over, the temple courtyard is not clean. It probably was a total mess with coins and bird feathers and furniture and, and, and angry, terror-stricken merchants running for cover. It was not clean. Jesus disrupts the temple and its status quo. I like to call it the sanctus quo, you know, little holy sounding things as they are. This story is meant to tell us that the arrival of Jesus completely disrupts and supplants the whole religious establishment. And not just this particular day, because I'm sure those mer merchants would have, you know, turned their tables right side up again uh, right away to, to go on with business. But Jesus' presence in the world is meant to be seen as a disruption of business as usual. The full extent of that 
disruption, of course, didn't happen in Jesus' lifetime, but about a generation or so later when war broke out and the temple and its magnificent surroundings that had taken 50 or more years to build were pillaged and completely destroyed. The daily sacrifices of the priests for the faithful in Jerusalem just ended when the Jewish people fled from their homeland. And all parts of the empire had Jewish settlements because they could no longer go home. And as we all know, they didn't have a nation again for 1,900 years. If his presence then disrupted a, a system of sacrifice and a system of wealth and power and privilege, what's the point of retelling that story now? It's 2,000 years ago. Is it merely one of those little odd things that are in the Bible that, that we're stuck with? Well, all four of the Gospels have a version of this story, and they suggest that Jesus' righteous wrath at this moment contributed a lot to the payback mentality of those priests and the powerful who would then plot to have him arrested and tried and, and convicted. We have this reading this morning as we lead up to Holy Week when we, we have the face-to-face -face confrontation, and Jesus is indeed betrayed and and taken captive and crucified under the Roman authorities, but with the full complicity of the Jewish authorities. But it leaves me, I, I suppose it does you as well, this, this kind of uneasy feeling, you know, about Jesus and his righteous wrath. We never see him this way. We never see him as a man of vengeance, do we? His, his advice is always to, you know, turn the other cheek, to walk the second mile, to, to give away everything to the poor and be kind to little children and animals, right? Jesus turning over the tables and, and shouting at the merchants? Why? I think it comes down to his own statement. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. In the other gospel accounts, the line reads like this. It is written, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So it's here, I think, that we, we leave the history lesson behind and, and the speculation about his motives. It's here we have to ask ourselves whether we see God's temple as a house of prayer and what it must mean for us if we're obedient to Jesus, if we're trying to follow in the way of Jesus. For one thing, we, we don't need to look at this as some kind of a, a, a put-down of the Jewish faith, the end of that temple and that generation after Jesus profoundly changed the Jewish faith, but it changed the Christian faith as well. There was no temple anymore, no daily sacrifices. There were only the little neighborhood synagogues. They were places of study, and there was only the book, the Torah. Jesus' people were uprooted and thrown out of their homeland, and so were the Gentiles who came to believe in Jesus, who went to all parts of the world with the gospel. For us, the cross of Christ was the last sacrifice, and our only anchor, the only thing we have, is the book, the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. That ought to be enough, huh? And this ought to be enough of a wake-up call that our faith isn't built on stone foundations. Our faith is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, who is revealed in the Bible. Amen? What happens, though? What happens when Christians no longer know the Bible, no longer read the Bible? It gets a little chuckle sometimes when, when you say, like I just did, about you're all bringing your Bibles to worship, right? They're worn and well-marked, and you use them all the time. Well, no, many of you don't do that. And this is not a guilt trip, my friends, but it's a wake-up call that if we're looking for faith in our own times, if we're seeking to find a God in a world that's just, you know, spinning out of control faster every day, and we don't know, and we don't read, and we don't care about the Bible, well, where then is our faith grounded? Where is it rooted? Where is your anchor when the storms of life hit you? And then there's this commercialism thing, this, this marketplace that Jesus mentions. Stop making my father's house into a marketplace. Jeffrey McDonald begins his book, Thieves in the Temple, the Christian Church and the Selling of the American Soul, with this disturbing story about a successful church in New York. 
Harlan Brandon, a middle-aged African-American businessman, still goes to church in the same part of Brooklyn where he grew up. But church for him is nothing like it used to be. He attends the Christian Cultural Center with its vast lobby and shops, a church presided over by the Reverend A.R. Bernard, a former banker who attracts about 10,000 people any given Sunday. Wow. Lavish in every respect, from the cushioned theater-style seating to the professional quality bands that play during the, the services, from three giant projector screens to the singers who are in matching charcoal suits. McDonald describes this megachurch as a monument to the gospel of prosperity. Prosperity. It has a $15 million annual budget. And the CCC is flourishing in Brooklyn while other churches there are floundering because it preaches prosperity. Jesus said, Reverend Bernard insists, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. Well, this sells very well among middle class people who want desperately to prosper, to catch the coattails of the American dream as it seems to be flying further and further away from us. Gone, though. Gone are those those biblical messages of simplicity and, and humility and poverty. Pushed aside, in my opinion, is the cross, the truth. The truth that when Jesus stood up and spoke the truth to power and threw out the merchants and the, and the money changers of this mega temple of his own times, he was prepared to suffer the cross in order to defeat what was phony and what was destroying the moral fiber of his nation. Reverend Bernard is not alone in America. There's, Reverend Joel Osteen in Houston claims to have 47,000 members in one church. And even the Reverend Robert Schuler down here, whose Crystal Cathedral has now been sold to the Catholic Diocese of Orange for $57.5 million. Even Reverend Schuler still expects to be paid over $5 million for his intellectual property in the bankruptcy they're going through. It's not merely that everybody has their hands in the religious cookie jar. The Christian faith, the Christian faith itself is getting hijacked by the American way of life. And we must be a, a little shocked about some of this stuff, or maybe even a little envious about those, you know, cushy theater seats that they get to sit in, the professional band. But we're susceptible to the lure of success in the church, or in the mall, or in the stock market, or in professional sports or politics. We expect everything to be glitzy and wonderful and expensive and classy. Jesus wants none of that in the temple of God. He calls us to conscience today, just as much as he did those pious and, and faithful people who allowed God's temple then to become a profitable marketplace. We don't need to, to fret or frown over whether people have gone astray, but we ought to be able to hear the call to faith in the Christ of the cross ourselves. We may hope to be prosperous. I mean, who wouldn't like to be, or at least, least middle class? Many of us in this church just hope to find a job, any job, for the money, yes, but also, you know, for the self-respect, for the self-esteem, so that we can remind ourselves that, that our lives have purpose and value and that we're contributing to the world around us. We hope to leave the world a better place. Jobs are good. Money's the currency of, of the way we get things done. But we're blessed. We are blessed if we also remember that prosperity has been the, the undoing of many individuals and, and many nations. How many famous people can we think of, movie stars and singers and so forth, that we have lost to the drugs and alcohol addictions that easy money was able to bring them? We're blessed to remember that God redeems this world not through the marketplace, not through money, but through changing our hearts. And so it is that the cross is written in your hearts, my friends. Not the dollar sign, the cross. It is the cross we remember, whether we have much or we have little, and we remember to share with those who have even less than we do. It is the scriptures that reveal to us that God's deepest truth, that his greatest gift that we have, is not that we've been given wealth stacked up, but that the life Jesus laid down for us changes our lives. And we're blessed to remember that we, you and I, and anybody who hears his word, we 
are the treasures that God has accumulated. I even think that we, and that I include all the Christian faithful anywhere, we can turn this economy around if it's rebuilt on the values that we have in Christ. Generosity, gratitude, simplicity, mercy, sharing with those who are struggling to survive in these times, if we believe the word of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.